Hello there and welcome to JJ Painting. I am JJ and what do we talk about on this here channel? Well, we talk about the hobby, of course. Tips and tricks on how to play the game and paint your toy soldiers, a retrospective of the hobby itself sometimes, book reviews, drunken explains, there's a bit of something for everyone. And today we're talking all about something which has come up quite a few times, Space Marine Castles. Now they were quite big back in 8th edition and they're still around for 9th edition, but they definitely changed. And I've been playing a lot of 40k and I've seen a lot of castles, I've played a lot of castles, and I think it's worth talking about them a little bit as well. So it's going to deconstruct some of the strengths, some of the weaknesses, and perhaps as well whether or not they still hold up the way they did back in 8th edition. And for today, I'm going to be painting this model right here. Yes, very, very castly as you can see. So without further ado, let's crack on. Before we get too far into it, I do want to say one thing about the castling with Space Marines in the whole, is that it's far more versatile and has a much broader scope than you would initially think looking at it on paper. From 8th edition, yes, most castles were very defensive, they very much had a habit of squatting in one corner of the board and staying there. Occasionally, you could divert that into two smaller castles, but they would still very much be defensive objects that didn't do a whole lot of moving. But nonetheless, the years of 8th edition are now past us, and we are now into 9th edition, obviously. And the 9th edition Space Marine Castle is really quite different as well, as we mentioned at the beginning of this video. Now, I think it's worth mentioning a couple of the really big strengths of a castle in Space Marines. Now, yes, for those of you who know me personally, I will say that castling isn't necessarily a bad thing, because for one thing, it does look quite good on paper overall, and when we then think about the typical composition of it, they do tend to fall into some quite specific categories. They often come with a chapter master, a librarian, and an apothecary as well as potentially a chaplain and in the case of chapters that don't really have librarians such as Templars you will almost certainly see a chaplain in the place of a librarian then obviously they're backed up by an elite choice often blade guard terminators or aggressors so something with three plus wounds that has a higher save or an invulnerable save or a higher toughness at the very least there's always a redemptor I find in some cases however there is an invicta war suit along with either eradicators devastators or hell blasters and then for the troop units to it off it's normally three units of infiltrators or incursors and maybe one unit of intercessors somewhere and overall that's quite a solid list anyway and you can put that into any chapters whether it's space wolves or salamanders and you're going to get quite a good result now there's one thing you might have noticed there when i said all that and that is virtually everything in that is primaris and this is something to bear in mind is that as we've moved more and more into primaris focused army lists in the last couple of years what has tended to happen is the focus has been on making primaris units work together and i will concede now that primaris units do tend to have overall slightly more synergy largely down to their mobility and homogenization of weapons whereas with the first ball marines you tend to have special weapons mixed in with things like bolt guns and or bolt pistols and chainsaws meaning that the units themselves aren't as quote unquote specialized as they are with primaris meaning that i'd say firstborn don't need to castle quite as much as primaris do in order to max out a lot of the re-rolls or the synergies or the plus ones or minus ones etc that you get from having castling characters now this brings me on to my next point about the, how the castle works as well is that a lot of the synergy isn't necessarily to do in most people's minds with how the units themselves actually work together they're actually more to do with the re-rolls and the auras that you get from the characters. Now that may sound like a, a painfully obvious thing to do, but you have to remember that when you do have multiple characters all affecting one or two or three units all at the same time, that does look very good on paper, but obviously you're then having to keep them all within range of them, but we'll get to that in a bit. But I think it's worth mentioning, just to summarise very quickly, on those Primaris units being the main feature of these castles is partly to do with the popularity of Primaris, but I would also say it's probably quite a lot to do with the fact that because so much attention has been given to Primaris units, they're most people's first consideration or their first thought when we start looking at Primaris armies, for want of a better word, rather than thinking of it as a Space Marine army or a Space Marine castle. Hence why from this point forward, I'm going to be referring to it as a Primaris castle, not a Space Marine castle. Now, I want to say a few things that are quite good about Primaris castles overall. And the thing you have to remember is that they are very flexible and their structure does accommodate most of the chapter tactics and most of the units that make the most of those chapter tactics. As you may have heard in that little list I said before, there were lots of things that fit in different categories. So yes, whilst there are all the different elites, Terminators, Aggressors, Blade Guard, etc. And those heavy units such as Eradicators and Hellblasters, etc. What you will notice there very quickly is that those units don't all have the same weapon composition. 
and they all work very differently in different chapter tactics. Obviously things like Blade Guard are going to do very well for Space Wolves, as would Terminators. But on the other hand, you've then got things like Aggressors, who would do better with Salamanders with Flamestorm Gauntlets, but would do better with Imperial Fists with the Boltstorm Gauntlets. So there is a lot of different ways to take them and a lot of different playstyles that that would fit. But that's a very obvious statement to make, and that's something which you don't need me to remind you of. But what I is worth saying, which can often go over people's heads, is that the overall composition of the castle can very easily be built around these units. It's not necessarily built around the auras and the buffs, rather than the units that are going to benefit them. But then this is where we have to take an ever so slight second look and a slightly more specific gauge as to what that means. And what this means in this respect is if you look at Imperial Fist Castle, taking things like aggressors with Bolt Storm Gauntlets or Heavy Intercessors or even the Redemptor Dreadnought, as well as yes, they will all still benefit from the re-rolling ones that the captain would give out for example and yes they would all benefit from the apothecary shrugs if they're infantry the units with the bolt weapons would then be benefiting arguably more from those re-rolls of ones because those exploding sixes would benefit them more we then look at something like a space wolf castle primaris castle and again then you'd start seeing potentially the same units in some respects so those aggressors those blade guards those heavy intercessors would all work very differently for one thing that plus one on the charge to hit roles and that ability to heroically intervene wherever would work very differently with Space Wolf Blade Guard and Space Wolf Aggressors than it obviously would with Imperial Fist units that are the same. Now this then brings me on to my next point into the versatility of the Space Marine Castle is that the way this army is structured using one aura piled on top of another aura piled on top of another aura piled on top of buffs and relics and warlord traits etc is that when you then build all that on top of the chapter master tray or the apothecary's abilities is that yes you do have lots of overlapping abilities which are all very good and it does mean that that part of the board has an enormous amount of damage output but can also take a lot of damage as well especially when you start giving buffs to the apothecary and another good thing about this way of playing is that you can actually accentuate individual characters that you want to be giving the majority of those buffs to so chapter masters are one thing you see quite frequently but obviously when you start seeing characters like Kalgar, Azriel, Grimnar etc who all have those abilities built into them you can then take that a step further by having chief librarians of your own or the master of the sanctity of your own having those additional prayers from the priest units or having the ability to combat revive and it not costing you any cp and those are all very good and that does give you flexibility in terms of how you want your characters to function and which characters you feel can give you the most bang for your buck and will be the most beneficial to your army list and for me personally i don't necessarily think that this is a bad way of approaching it either knowing that you're not going to just take the baseline levels of buffs and auras that your characters give you but knowing that you can experiment and boost them further with certain things and another thing i think that's worth mentioning that is very good about the way of playing castles is that it gives itself a propensity towards smaller units so you don't need blobs as much as you would do this is partly to do with all the bonuses that you're giving to your damage output so that it means that smaller units can put out far more firepower than larger units without those buffs but also it does mean that with those smaller units they become hardier for having those characters around them to keep them alive but that is a bit of a double-edged sword which is something else we'll get to shortly before i give a quick summary of that there's one more thing i should say is that a castle is also quite tough to crack with just sheer brute force you do have to be clever if you're playing against it and you can't just run everything into it and hope for the best you do have to either pick it apart piece by piece or hope that you can outmaneuver or outflank or get some board domination in before you break the castle so, to very quickly recap what I've said so far, the good things about a Space Marine Castle is that it's a very flexible structure that accommodates all the various chapter tactics. It does, of course, leave individual space for your flair and allows you the freedom to experiment with the characters you want as well. It gives itself that propensity towards small units, so you don't need to worry about being succumbing to blast weapons these days. And it's a very tough nut to crack with brute force in most cases. However, there are a few drawbacks to castling armies, which unfortunately are quite common. And the first thing about castling armies is they're not very mobile. And obviously Space Marines aren't exactly a slow army, which is true. But when you're having to keep your army in one place to benefit from those synergies, that does mean that your ability to control the board diminishes really quite quickly. And yes, you probably have about 12 inches or so that your army completely dominates in a 24 inch zone around that, which you can definitely reach easily enough. 
but that's it. And when you're playing on a 6x4 board, that's a disadvantage that you start to feel very keenly. Against some armies, it won't be much of an issue. Slow armies like Orcs and Death Guard you'll probably be okay with. But when you're fighting things like Drakari or Harlequins or even Necrons with their fast vehicles, suddenly it becomes noticeable just how much slower you are than your opponent. And it's very easy to find yourself in a position where you're being outmaneuvered and outflanked. And this brings me on to my next point. You're not a very maneuverable army either. Yes, some castles can make excellent use of extending auras and building things in and writing things into your list such as faster tanks or outriders or other bikes or other flying units can definitely help mitigate this. But then again, that does mean you've only got maybe one or two units that effectively have to operate on their own as quote unquote outriders but will be struggling to get support from the rest of the army if the rest of them are stuck within this 5-6 inch bubble. And this becomes a bit more of a problem, especially when some of the units only have a 5 inch move, or when there's heavy weapons that need to be buffed, and you have to make the decision as to whether or not they're going to stay still, or they're going to sacrifice their accuracy and hope that that can be mitigated thanks to the auras and thanks to the buffs that they will be receiving. And another thing to remember about this way of playing with castling with multiple characters is that it does actually open you up to two secondaries that can very much damage your way of playing if you're playing competitively and that's things such as the battlefield supremacy secondaries and the assassinate secondaries now obviously this is entirely down to how many characters you personally take in the case of assassination but at the point that you're taking up to three characters that's easily tense points to your opponent if they're able to kill all of them and with a lot of the other secondaries out there at the moment, and I said this in my previous secondaries video, it's sometimes difficult to know which ones to take, but when you see more than three characters in one army, something like Assassinate is a bit of an auto-take. And if I go over to the Battlefield Supremacy ones very quickly, at the point that you're taking a castle that can only move at a certain speed, your opponent can start taking things such as Engage in All Fronts and even Stranglehold relatively calmly, knowing that they're going to have a fairly solid chance to get some free command points off before you can do anything about that. And I think the last thing to remember about a castle is that a castle is only as strong as its weakest point, and at the moment the castle starts to crack, it can start to break very quickly. And the thing about the castling units, ultimately, is it doesn't matter what they are, whether they're aggressors, blade guard, outriders, dreadnoughts, they all still very much are space marines, which are expensive units, but when they start dropping, then that can be a quite keenly felt loss. This brings me back to what I said about the smaller units. A small unit that starts to lose models quickly is a very keenly felt loss very quickly. Because unlike if you're playing Orcs or even Death Guard to an extent, when you can have larger units and feel relatively comfortable that something's going to survive, you are actually putting yourself at a big risk by putting lots of small units in one place, because again, you're sacrificing board control. But on top of that, if you start taking casualties, then your effectiveness starts to diminish very, very quickly. So if we recap on some of the drawbacks of playing a castle army, is that you do lack mobility and you can be easily outmaneuvered. You do give up some of the secondaries to your opponent if your list is either built a certain way or you're playing a certain way. And obviously if your castle starts to be broken up, if your models start dying, you become vulnerable quite quickly. And just to add to that as well, you have to remember that playing as a castle does put a lot of eggs in one basket. And it does mean that you are very literally having to condense your army down to doing one or two things. And there's one other thing to bear in mind about a Space Marine Castle. A lot of people have been seeing Space Marine Castles for a while, which means most people know what to do when they see a castle now. And as a result, the castle as a strategic option doesn't have the same impact as it did about two years ago, or even three years ago in 8th, and it doesn't have the same, for want of a better word, surprises that it had in the early period of 9th edition. And I think because 9th edition as a system has become turned over and over and over so many times and everyone's looked at it from many different angles and the Space Marine Castle was very common, especially early on, it's something which most people have a very good counter to now, especially for people who aren't playing Marines. And I've seen Marine players play other Marine players and they're both playing castles and those games can both take a very long time to get through but also be really quite tedious for both people to play because ultimately it's two very static blocks of infantry that aren't going anywhere. And ultimately, I think this brings me on to my absolute last point when it comes to the castling method, is that castling was an effective tactic and it was a, a way to play Marines and it still is a way to play Marines. 
but it should never be seen as the only way to play Marines, and I do personally feel like this is where we've headed a little bit. Yes, it's effective, yes, it has its advantages, but it does have its drawbacks, and those drawbacks are quite well known. So if you are playing Marines, I would say that castling, whilst it can be effective, if you're going to use it, you need to bring something to the table that we've not seen before. My two alternatives to this, which are castles, are things I've seen. First of all, there's the White Scars Castle, which is fast. And you have to remember, this one still has mostly infantry units. There's only a handful of bikes in there. It can advance and fire its assault weapons without having to worry about any shooting penalties. And that's something which not a lot of people are expecting, firstly from White Scars, but also from a castling army to be fast and aggressive. The other castling army that I've seen was one which was also quite mobile, only because it literally deep struck. And that was made up largely of terminators, of suppressors, of assault marines, and of characters with jump packs. But that one also was predominantly made up of firstborn. And that's another thing. We don't see many firstborn castles, but ultimately we don't see many of them just because firstborn aren't as popular as they used to be, but they still work. And there are weapons and entire units within the firstborn range that are slowly starting to be forgotten, but they still have their place in the game and they're definitely effective and they are worth remembering. So to conclude on this video about Space Marine Castles, if you're going to use a Space Marine Castle, make sure you're bringing something new to the table. Don't just rely on what's been going around for a little while now, because everyone's seen it and everyone will have a counter to it. And the other thing to remember is that just because things like this work quite well, doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to enjoy using it either. I've seen a couple of people who've played Space Marine Castles and they didn't have much fun in those games. I've seen people run castling Space Marines in the past and they just didn't quite, it didn't quite click for them either. And it's not a question of winning or losing or how well you do in a tournament. Tournament. It's about actually being able to have a good time with that particular army. And if you do like the idea of the castle and you want it to be a competitive choice, bring something which no one's expecting. And I always say that's something to bear in mind with any army you do. Make sure you fit it to yourself and let it surprise you, because you never know when you will surprise yourself or your opponents. Don't feel like you have to stick to what every other army is structured like and allow yourself to experiment in your own way. But anyway, as always, I leave it down to you guys. What do you think about the Space Marine Castle? Do you think it's fine as is? Do you think people should stop doing them entirely? Or do you think Space Marine Castles can be around for a bit longer if there's something unique to them? Let me know your thoughts. I look forward to hearing from you. So those are my thoughts on Space Marine Castles. And let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. And whilst you're down there, like, subscribe, all that good YouTube shilly stuff. I post new videos, obviously, every week. And also whilst you're down there as well in the comments, check out my website, see the services I provide. Have a look at my Patreon if you want to support the channel. Check out my Element Affiliate link or just my Instagram if you want to have a look at some toy soldiers I painted. But thank you all very, very much for watching. Goodbye and have a lovely day.